Good afternoon and welcome everybody. If you are joining us, uh, we will get started shortly. We are letting people into the room and we will uh, get started at noon. We also ask that you stay muted. You are currently muted and we ask that you stay muted throughout the presentation today. One last thing is this session is being recorded and we will be making the recording available after today's program. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll get started momentarily. We still have a lot of people coming into the room. So be patient, we'll get started shortly. I will let you know that this session is being recorded and we do ask that you remain muted during today's presentation.
Thank you very much, everybody, for your patience. And um, with that, we will get started with the program. I will let you know that this is being recorded so that you can um, watch it or share it. We will post the link later and um, send that to you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yvonne Harris. Happy Wednesday. And I'm glad uh, to see all of you here uh, this afternoon. I'm honored to serve as the chair for ADL's Women's Initiative. And thank you again for joining us today. Uh, this webinar was rescheduled from last week, which turned out to be a little more eventful um, than we anticipated. Um, but we'd still like to take this opportunity today to recognize Women's Equality Day and celebrate the collective strength and spirit of all of the women and allies who fueled our country suffrage movement and created space in our civic process to record the voices of generations of wise, hardworking, powerful women who were our mothers, our grandmothers, our sisters, our aunts, our sheroes. As a reminder, ADL was founded in 1913 in response to an escalating climate of anti-Semitism and bigotry. ADL is a leading anti-hate organization with a timeless mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. Today, ADL continues to fight all forms of hate with the same vigor and passion as a nonpartisan 501c3 organization. By extension, ADL, ADL's Women's Initiative is, um, also works to unite diverse women professionals in ADL's efforts to promote respect, challenge bigotry, all through dialogue and awareness. Like the program we're about to experience today, the Women's Initiative sponsors several events annually featuring distinguished, engaging speakers on topics related to ADL's overall mission. Today's panel of committed experts will share the history and the importance of the women's suffrage movement and discuss the challenges to voting that so many still face today, although the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote over 100 years ago. To that last point, there are some who believe that the number 100 symbolizes promise and resurrection. These these meanings strike a powerful chord with me as I consider the special anniversary for suffrage and also to the upcoming election. I will now turn our program over to today's moderator, Rachel Bresner, ADL, Jean and Jerry Moore Southwest Civil Rights Council. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Yvonne, and thank you all again for being here with us today. I'm Rachel Bresner, and I'm so pleased to be moderating this panel virtually alongside these phenomenal women to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing and protecting women's constitutional right to vote. This historic centennial offers us an unparalleled opportunity to commemorate this milestone for our democracy and to also explore its relevance to the issues of equal rights today. The 19th Amendment was not the beginning or the end. It was just one mile marker on a long continuous highway with a lot of road before its passage and a lot of road since its passage. Achieving this right took decades of work and the fight for women's equity and equal access to the ballot still continues today. It's a surprise to some that the 19th Amendment doesn't actually say anything about women. Instead, the 19th Amendment promises that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The passage of the 19th Amendment was a historic moment that paved the way for the largest expansion of democracy in the history of our nation. In theory, it extended the vote to between 26 and 30 million women. Yet the movement faced many challenges in the following years, including low voter turnout by women, barriers to voting rights for all women, and protracted legal battles. Even after its ratification 100 years ago, many women were denied the ability to freely exercise that right. 
for years, many Native American women were not considered citizens with voting rights in this country. And for some Asian Americans, it would take even longer. Many Black women cannot freely exercise this right until 1965, when the Voting Rights Act barred racially discriminatory voting practices, such as literacy tests. Yet here we are, even 100 years later, and we know that disenfranchisement at the polls still continues today. Commemorating the 100th Amendment, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment offers a lesson in the messiness, complexities, and compromises that are involved in any movement for social change. With that in mind, we are joined by three remarkable panelists today who will share their insight on the history and legacy of the 19th Amendment and on ways to honor the suffragists by continuing the fight for equal rights. First, I am so excited that we have Dr. Melanie Price with us. She is the Endowed Professor of Political Science at Prairie View A&M University and is the Principal Investigator for their African American Studies Initiative. Her research and teaching interests include Black politics, public opinion, political rhetoric, and social movements. She is a regular contributor for the New York Times and has done political commentary for media outlets like CNN, Miss Magazine, Vox, Pacifica, and New York City and Connecticut Public Radio. Thank you, Melanie, for being here with us. We also have um, Professor Leandra Zarno, who is an associate professor in the Department of History and affil affiliate faculty in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Pro Studies program at the University of Houston. She's a specialist in US women's political, legal, and intellectual history and has additional interest in media and archival studies and global gender history. Along with historian Stacy Taranto, Dr. Zarno co-edited the collection Suffrage at 100, Women in American Politics Since 1920, which was published in August. I'm also so excited that we have Grace Shemaine here with us. Grace is the president of the League of Women Voters Texas a nonpartisan grassroots civic organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. A retired pediatric nurse practitioner, she joined League of Women Voters Texas in 2012, has served on its board since 2014, and also served as its advocacy chair. She specializes in the use of technology to support the League's mission of empowering voters and defending democracy. Thank you so much for being with us today. We have a lot to cover, so now let's get started. First, Leandra, I'm going to start with you. Um, to properly commemorate this anniversary, it's important to look at the history of the fight for women's suffrage. What did the women's uh, suffrage movement and the ratification of the 19th Amendment accomplish, and how did it change America into the America that we now know and love? Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm thrilled to speak to you on this issue. Uh, in a very small amount of time, I probably won't hit every point <laughs> of the last yeah. 100 years, but I would say that the, achieving the vote was no small measure. This was over a 70-year struggle for women to gain political citizenship, and voting power is the gateway to political power. And I'm sure we'll speak a lot about that today. Voting yeah. and the ratification of the 19th Amendment shifted status for women from indirect to direct influence in politics and was a gateway to full citizenship um, on every front, from education to uh, being uh, workers um, to being recognized uh, you know, in marriage um, and citizenship as well. And so one thing to really think about, however, is that this was a half open door. And I think it's really important to understand as we're commemorating the 100th that uh, this is an important uh, st uh, uh, stock taking moment uh, where we think about and recover the broader history of suffrage. And so I wanna just draw focus to what's happening now. Um, historians throughout the United States are thinking about how we have remembered suffrage, how it's written in the history books. And often it's the only thing that we hear from about women's history in, in textbooks. And we have two towering figures, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who are uh, really household names. But there's a reason for that. And that is because these two figures 
uh, wrote a multi-volume history of women's suffrage and placed themselves at the center. And this was the story uh, that was told. And so now we are looking at the centennial as a commemorative moment, more than a celebration, really thinking about who were those early farmers and mill workers who wrote petitions um, for suffrage too? Who were the women of color and poor women advocating for their voting rights alongside race and gender lines? Who were the new immigrants? Um, who were the indigenous people? Who were the Mexican American landowners um, who lost those rights um, at this particular moment? So we're doing this work nationally. And so I'd like to encourage you all to see Rightfully Hers, which is an online exhibit that the National Archives put together. And we're doing this locally. And so the Heritage Society um, took an initiative to recover over 2,000 women who voted in Harris County in 1920 and a considerable number of African-American women. So I want to make clear that the 19th Amendment was largely assuring economically privileged white women the vote. And um, really, as, as uh, Rachel mentioned, 1965 is our marker, the, the moment that the Voting Rights Act uh, put into, was put into place. Um, my second point that I want to bring attention to is that um, we're acknowledging more openly right now that the reason women did not have the vote for so long was because the US political system was exclusionary by design and prioritized male citizens. And this preference goes all the way back to before the American Revolution when British colonists brought over a common law system um, known as coverture. And so essentially this was, as, as a really great uh, historian, Linda Kerber uh, once described, as if women lived under a legal umbrella held by men, their fathers, their husbands, their sons, that they could never quite get out from under. And so this is why, you know, husbands and fathers represented, uh, you know, women in court. Um, and this is why there was the assumption that women did not need the vote because they were basically um, putting forward a family vote. And this is how we get to women's issues in our current politics. And women politicians have trouble if they step out of these issues or if they do not strongly identify as classic, classically feminine. So I think that this struggle of trying to get from voting power to political power is with us still. And I'd like us to talk today why it's taking more than 100 years to get to um, gender equity. Thank you. Absolutely. We're going to come back to that. But before we do, I just wanted to touch on one thing that you mentioned, and Absolutely. that's the fact that the ratification of the 19th Amendment, it was an amazing moment and milestone for women, but not for all women. And Melanie, I wanted to uh, pose this to you. Um, how were race and gender intertwined throughout the women's suffrage movement, and how is it still intertwined in the struggle for true equal voter access? Sure. I mean, one of the things that we have to remember is that, you know, before the Civil War, um, abolition of slavery and suffrage were tied together. The activists were friends, they advocated together, they talked to each other, they, they, talk, they were the same uh, sort of constituency, right? And then at the end of the Civil War, when, ab when slavery is actually abolished, then Black men are given the right to vote. And so then the question of universal suffrage becomes sort of a separate thing from the issue of race. But it's important to always think about, I think, the ways in which the notion of freedom for everybody, that is freedom for African Americans, was tied to suffrage, right? That is, free people vote. And if you are free, you are a voter. Thus, Black people who had been enslaved and women who were not represented in the political process all sort of saw themselves as trying to jump into the process together. But after the passage of the 15th Amendment, when African American men get the right to vote, because uh, you know Black women are Black, but they are women, they don't get access to the ballot. And so then we move forward to the passage of the 20th Amendment, and then women get access to the ballot, but Black women are women, but they are Black, and Black people at that moment are being uh, pr pretty much um, knocked out of the voting process across uh, most of the country. And so it's important, I think, to always, moments like this always make me think about how incremental change has been in this country and the ways in which if we don't think about things as universal and actually make that universe everyone, then we leave people out of the process. So if you focus on just the rights of men to exercise the franchise, 
then you leave out women. If you focus just on African Americans, then you might potentially leave out other people. And so the Voting Rights Act of 1965 becomes sort of the, it's sort of the cleanup crew of lots of the ways in which the 15th Amendment, I'm sorry, and the 19th Amendment didn't um, sort of do all of the things that it was meant to do. Now in modern times with the, the ways in which the, the Voting Rights Act has been undermined, the question is what will be the next um, large scale voting rights uh, legislation amendment process that will then usher us back into a moment of universal suffrage, which really does not, um, it's important that we understand that voting as a universal um, thing that everyone should participate in is a thing that has evolved as a concept in this country over, over time. And it's something that is still evolving as we think about what voter access means, right? Whether or not you should be able to register on the day that you decide to go vote, right? Is that voter access? Whether or not you should be able to vote online, is that voter access, right? We are still sort of grappling with this question, mostly because more than trying to define who gets, who gets to vote, we seem to be constantly interested in making sure that the wrong people don't vote, right? Which is a, 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 the wrong framing of voting, right? And even now when people talk about fraud, it's a question about making sure the wrong people don't get access to the franchise. When we really should be thinking about how can we get as many people as possible involved in the process. Thank you, Melanie. One of the things you mentioned was how incremental things have changed. And right. in a lot of ways, the, the amendments ratification marks the beginning of millions of women moving closer to equity in all aspects of American life. And Leandra, you touched on this before, and I want to come back to it. Um, we know that, um, you know, 100 years ago, after the ratification of the, of the 19th Amendment, political candidates started to focus more on women's issues in an effort to get elected. Women began starting to advocate for laws that would allow them to have more independence, more economic security. More women started to seek out public office, particularly at the local level. And in the years that have followed, um, you talk a lot about the increased shift from voting power to political power. This a uh, 100th year anniversary arrives amid other milestones, as Yvonne mentioned earlier, and more women than ever in history are running for Congress in 2020. New records are being set for the number of women of color who are major party candidates. And we will soon see Senator Kamala Harris, the first woman of color as a vice presidential candidate on a major party presidential ticket. So, Leandra, can you talk to us about this shift and why it's taken so long and the hurdles that are still faced by women getting involved in politics? Absolutely. And I think um, it's really important at this moment to think about contingency. Contingency matters. And so if we think about uh, the last moment, the last moment of fighting for the 19th Amendment, uh, this really comes into play. It came down to one vote in Congress, and then it came down to one vote in uh, the Tennessee legislature and a 24-year-old named Harry Burns, who got a um, pretty pointed letter from his mother the previous night and said, you better not, um, you know, basically piss off Carrie Chapman Cat and put rat in ratification. So I think that um, sometimes we forget how these struggles sometimes come down to an individual as much as a collective, and I wanted to draw focus to that. Um, and I was really appreciative that uh, Senator Kamala Harris brought attention to that in her speech, uh, accepting the nomination for vice president. I think it's fabulous that she um, has been selected, but the question is why has it taken so long? And um, so this is something that a lot of organizations that have focused on uh, voting have really thought about um, voting and gender. And so for instance, in 1971, the National Women's Political Caucus was founded. It was a nonpartisan organization that was focused on trying to bring more women candidates into politics. And they predicted at that time, and they didn't think this was unreasonable, that by 2020, there would be 50-50 gender representation in Congress. Um, and actually in the last um, election cycle, they reconstituted that goal. And unfortunately, we're not gonna make it. 
So we have, you know, roughly a quarter in the Senate um, who are women and the same going on in um, the House of Representatives. We have Speaker Pelosi, um, but we're not quite there. And uh, Bella Abzug, who was one of the founders of the National Women's Political Caucus and really honed in on this issue in her 1984 book, Gender Gap, said, trying to achieve political power without electoral power is like unlocking a door and then failing to open it. Um, so I think that's interesting because that kind of turns on the head, this voting power to political power moment. Um, and so we you know, need the organizations like Grace um, is the president of League of Women Voters, organizations like the National Women's Political Caucus, um, new uh, organizations such as um, She Should Run. Uh, and these are really, really important, I think, to um, encourage women to move into politics because there's an enduring male political leadership ideal. That's our default uh, in thinking about leadership. And so sometimes we need that push, that infrastructure that supports uh, fundraising, that supports um, you know, training uh, women in politics and also enables them to imagine themselves to, um, to being there. Um, because it's not necessarily going to come from the party's infrastructure. And so, for instance, in 1920, there was a big concerted push in both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party on the part of uh, women partisans to actually achieve 50-50 representation. So this idea, this concept is not new. Um, ultimately, uh, what happened was that, um, in both parties until the mid-50s, there wasn't any more um, delegates than about 16%. It never really went past that number. And so that's really, I think, significant. And that became a major you know, fight in the 1970s at the high you know, point of women's political um, interests. And so one great historian, Paula Baker said, women were offered a stool and not a ladder. And I think that um, we are getting better on that front, but really we have to fight for our own ladder. Thanks, Leandra. While we are here to commemorate the 100th anniversary, and we do need to use this opportunity to celebrate how far we have come, it's crucial to acknowledge that there is still so much more work to do in terms of voting equity. Many Americans still do not fully enjoy equal voting rights. Voter suppression efforts persist and disproportionately target voter, voters of color immigrant voters, LGBTQ plus voters, and voters with disabilities. And as a result, many women living at the intersection of any of these identities. Grace, I wanna to turn to you in your role as president of League of Women Voters Texas. What voter suppression tactics do you continue to see and what solutions do you advocate for? Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I, the League of Women Voters mission is empowering voters and defending democracy. And we're nonpartisan. We never support or oppose uh, political parties or political candidates. I'm just throwing that out there because that's what I always start yeah. with. Uh, <laughs> that's so important. It is important. It's important to know and it's important to understand. So there are so what. So I'm from Texas, and uh, so that's where I know most of these uh, types of voter suppression are coming from, is from my knowledge of the Texas system. And one of them is voter registration. With the voter registration here in Texas, we still have, I call it archaic or horse and buggy, uh, the voter registration system where uh, it is basically involves a, a actual piece of paper that you have to physically sign. Most of the time uh, it involves a volunteer deputy registrar who is working with you face to face while you fill out that form. Uh, each deputy volunteer deputy registrar has to be uh, approved by a county. So there's 254 counties in Texas and so that means each you could only register those voters in that county. Why is this important? 40 other states use online voter registration where people can get on their phones, they have Wi-Fi or broadband, they get on their phones and they can update their voter registration or they could change, uh, they could apply uh, to be a voter in their state or in their county. But in Texas, we don't have that. Why is that important? Well, right now we have COVID going on and we don't have that in-person interaction. One, two, uh, where are people gathering? Well, people aren't gathering right now because of social distancing. And so they did, uh, without online voter registration, it's really hard 
uh, to continue that upward trend we had going of getting all those voters registered. And uh, three, we're having trouble uh, finding uh, places that would allow uh, even to have the voter registry access to a voter registration card. Now, how does this impact women in particular, but especially uh, younger people or people uh, with lower incomes because they, they more, most of, most people don't have a printer at home. So they would not be able to print up a form. They would not be able to, uh, any young people I know, especially my kids, but young people in general, uh, don't have access to stamps and envelopes. They just, it's just one of those things that uh, it's a generational thing. You do stamps, they don't. Uh, and so the voter registration, as soon as COVID hit, it's just like the voter registration just leveled out and then started going down. And no steps have been taken really to help improve that. Um, so that's voter registration. Another thing right now, it, in Texas, it's like lots of little things. Every legislative session we go, something happens. It's like, oh man, we try to stop the bad stuff from happening and then something else happened. Last legislative session, we stopped some really bad stuff. But one thing got through and it was, um, it seems little, it was, it stopped all uh, temporary polling places. Temporary polling places, you know, we have three weeks of early voting. Right now, if your polling place can't be open for those entire three weeks, it's not allowed to be a polling place. They used to have temporary polling places where you could have a smaller community, a college, a community college, a smaller group of folks, uh, that normally, that now are not being served because they cannot have a temporary polling place. That is huge. And I, that bill just sort of slipped in because I'm sure those people out in those communities out in Texas don't want to have a polling place for their community. And now it, it decreases access to the votes. It is little things like that, that are, we're continuously fighting uh, in Texas in order to make it so more people have access to the vote. So that those are two things right now. We're fighting, of course, the vote by mail where COVID's going on and you would think that people would be able to uh, apply to vote by mail and uh, if they want, if they chose to, then they could vote in the safety of their home but that is not available here in Texas, even though we tried with several lawsuits. Um, we're still encouraging people to apply if they are eligible through the, um, uh, vote, through the as it, if they have any type of disability that would Im be impacted by COVID, they are able to apply. Other, other things, I was talking about the temporary polling places, other things that are impacting people and communities, especially communities of color right now, is that due to COVID, and many of the polling places have been shutting down during the elections because uh, the people who normally work are these you know, wonderful, brave folks who are 65, 75 years of age and they're unable to be poll workers right now. So we're having a big push to try to get younger poll workers. Meanwhile, if that doesn't happen, then the polling sites in communities could be shut down. And this is something that we're working on uh, closely in all the communities to try to get more younger uh, poll workers who are able to tolerate COVID. Uh, when uh, the governor makes his, gave us that extra week of early voting, he didn't make it so that uh, poll workers and poll watchers had to wear the mask. Voters, you know, sometimes wear a mask. Don't, don't, I encourage everybody to wear a mask, but I'm not gonna keep anybody from the poll because it's important everybody have access to the poll. But um, having those poll workers and poll watchers without masks, it, it's just a, a a horrible thing, that, a horrible decision that the governor made that I wish we're still trying to encourage him to change 
so that we could keep all the voters and all these wonderful poll workers that are out there safe from COVID. Those are sort of some things that are going on right now. Uh, and I could talk on forever, but I wanted to uh, throw it back at you and see if you had some specific questions. Yeah, I do have a follow up. Um, how are you working to empower girls and women, particularly women of color and those with less access and privilege to assert their voice to get involved in the election process and in the political process? So one of the, some of the things that we're doing is providing uh, high school uh, voter registration activities pre-COVID and maybe some right now where we are in uh, have this program called the First Vote Program so that when we go into a school, we have a program to talk about not just registering them to vote because that is only the first step, but also how why is it important what is the process so that they feel comfortable with it? We're even, even uh, encouraging schools to do um, their social studies teachers to do a field trip for those kids who are going to vo be voting for the first time because it is scary for kids. And so you go and so schools will often have the leagues where they know we're nonpartisan and then encourage uh, those kids to take the first uh, vote program and encourage the schools to take them on a field trip to uh, have their um, first vote in the comfort with their teachers or with their other, with their friends. So that's one of the programs we have right now. Great. And I just wanted to mention, and this goes to some of the questions that we're receiving too, um, following the webinar, we will be sending out an email that has all of these resources and more. Um, so some of your questions will be answered directly um, through those resources and in that email. Uh, Melanie, I wanted to turn to you. I heard you speak about the current times that we're living in and this time of racial reckoning following the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. And you spoke about this being a monumental and unique time in history where many across the nation are engaged in conversations about race and racial equity and are advocating for the equal rights of others. How might lessons from the women's suffrage movement inspire subsequent social justice movements and be used to push current movements calling for racial equity and a more inclusive and equal society and democracy. Sure. Um, it's funny, I was just about to interject anyway, um, because I, I, it goes without saying, but one of the things I think we need to say is that the thing that's most important about women's access to the vote and their ability to elect other women is that having women in the halls of power changes the conversation. Right. No one can do the job that women do in legislatures. It's not the same. Just their very presence there, even if they're not the ones necessarily sponsoring the bills, it means that you're going to get more, more bills around education, more bills that are about sort of helping children and families. All of those things show up when women are present in legislatures and women are present in government governing bodies. And so we need to be sure that the vote is not just about us exercising the vote. It's about getting something back for women and oftentimes for children because we are so um, linked. But the thing I want to say about uh, George Floyd and what is happening right now is, you know, America goes through these really important moments where it has to ask itself, what are you going to look like for the next generation? What are you going to look like for the next little while? And we can point to really important moments. We can uh, count, point to Reconstruction. We can point to the World War I and World War II. I think I would put the women's suffrage movement in the passage of the 19th Amendment in there. And then the Civil Rights Movement, where we get to sort of look at what we've done so far and think about, is that the way we want to keep going? And I think that the moment where we're, that we're in right now, where everybody, not just African Americans, who see the issue of police brutality or see the issue of vigilante violence as an issue that is uniquely happening to them. And so they must be the ones who 
both bear the brunt and deal with the problem. Not just them, but you have, you know, suburban white women, you have, you know, um, um, Native Americans, you have Latinos, you have all kinds of people who are saying, what is our country going to look like when it comes to race going forward? And how are we going to talk about that? And what are the ways that we can unify ourselves, right? Because if we consider ourselves Americans, and we all do, and we plan to live in this place called America, and so far, you know, I mean, I'm not packing up yet. And so if that's the case, then <laughs> what is this going to look like, right? Who, what are the kinds of things I want to hear leaders saying that make me um, feel like this is a country that is really thinking about everyone? What is the kind of things that I want to hear my neighbors saying and doing that make us think about whether or not this is a country? Because one of the most important things I think about voting is that in order for you to vote, you have to buy into the American project. If you don't buy into it, then you're not going to participate. And so there's a real chance, particularly around young people, that we have to keep talking about what's happening right now because there is a desire on their part to opt out, right? That is to say, you know, my grandma voted, my mom voted, all of you voted, you know, and what has voting ever gotten us? Like, you, I, as a person who's on college campuses, I'm sure Leandra probably hears this all the time, and I have to say, wait a minute, this American project only works if we participate in, in the process, right? So I think we're all sort of trying to figure out what's going to happen. And the thing that gives me the most promise is that there is, I keep telling, this is the example I keep telling all my friends. I have been teaching and talking about race since the late 1990s. Now I feel like there's a whole new set of people who are listening, paying attention, and trying to figure out how to pass the test, right? They're trying to figure out what it is they need to do to actually make things better around them. And that, the talking about race happens all the time. The desire for so many different kinds of people, institutions, and organizations, corporations, to actually deal with it at once, that does not happen all the time. And so it's interesting, it'll be interesting to see what sort of comes of this moment as we're all having these conversations. If I may just piggyback Thank you. on Melanie's point, yeah. I think actually what I'm noticing is that students are wanting to opt in. And mm -hmm. so that has really been an, a compelling shift. And so in an hour, I'll be having my first voting rights and uh, law class, mm -hmm. totally full. And the students are super engaged and um, they want to be part of a democratic experiment, but they want to see a new uh, you know, a new reckoning, essentially, mm -hmm. and um, are very much seeing the, the power of the vote, but trying to understand how it's been used and misused. Uh, and so I think that's a really important part that will come out of this suffrage centennial, as well as the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment. Um, so those are some share, you know, shared uh, commemorative moments and important in our constitutional history. Um, you know, what, what do we want to do with the vote going forward? What do we want our, um, got our leadership to look like? Um, what do we want justice to be defined as? Um, and so I think that this, this commemorative moment allows us to have those kinds of conversations and be very reflective about it. And also to understand the importance of knowing our history too. And so this is, a, this is an opportunity for us to go back and to learn about a lot, a, a range of suffragists, um, you know, of every, um, shape and size and every, um, you know, ideological leaning um, because we're political in all these different ways that um, can be quite beautiful in, in some particular moments um, and quite ugly in others. And so I think that's really, really important to, to recognize in this, in this moment and also to consider when are uh, women um, collectively uh, powerful and what we've seen actually, at least in Congress, is that women are able to get into Congress and also have um, greater chances at candidacies uh, when this country is in crisis. And so we see like this jump going up um, during the Great Depression, after Watergate, um, as a result of Anita Hill being unfairly put through the ringer during Clarence Thomas's nomination hearings, and then 
with Trump's election. And so these are the moments that there's more than one to 2% bumps in Congress. These are the moments where thousands of women run. We don't know any of their stories. We only know some of the, the greats. Um, and so let's you know, really start to be reflective of all of the sojourners of, of suffrage. Thank you both. I wanna go back to something that you both mentioned. And since you're professors, um, we got a couple questions related to how COVID is impacting students and how it's going to impact them in the upcoming elections, especially when schools are now going virtual. Is that something that you can touch on? Sure. I mean, I would like to, I'd like to talk about it in detail. Um, mine. One of the things that uh, happens at Prairie View is that we are in constant, as the, the students are in constant conflict with the with Waller County. Um, it is well documented. Many of you may know. Um, I was a student there in the 90s. Um, there were cases, there were um, inappropriate indictments of people who were accused of voter fraud then. We currently are under litigation against the county. Um, there ha we have a Supreme Court case that went forward in the 1970s that basically established the right of Prairie View students to vote in Waller County that also incidentally gave student, college students all over the country the right to vote wherever they are. And so we know about as a student body and as an institution, what it means for our presence to be in constant conflict with the voting process where we have been situated since 1876, right? And so as we think about that, our students are having to deal with the fact that they are always under extra scrutiny by the Waller County uh, Registrar and the Waller County District Attorney around voting, but also what happens when they, they make up a huge voting block in Waller County, but now that they have opted to stay home, many of them, they have not returned to school, that also means that they don't get to participate in the voting process in Waller County because their only address that they would use would be their dormitories or the apartments they live in on campus. Mm -hmm. And so we're having to think through what that means in terms of their ability to influence an election in a place that they'll probably be back in in January, or if not January, they'll be back there by the summertime. And so there's lots of ways that COVID has sort of displaced the place where they would normally have their political uh, voice heard. But we're also then having to say, maybe you should think about, be sure to get registered wherever you are, right? So normally as soon as, um, as soon as students arrive on campus, the students start having voter registration drive. But if you're in Oklahoma and you don't have a permit address in Prairie View, you cannot vote there. And so we have to say, look, for this election, get registered where you're going to be if you can't get access to the place where you normally would vote, right? And so what that means is for college students all over the state, they're having to figure out if they have been voting in College Station, but they're back in El Paso for the semester, staying with their parents, they're gonna have to figure out where that, what that vote actually means. But it also talks a lot about votes matter in terms of influence. Right, and so what influence would those students have had if they had actually been in place in the in, in Waller County? And so we're all having to try to figure out at what is going to be sort of an unpredictable outcome. Thank you. There are a lot of layers, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of layers there. Just to know though that they are very organized. That's the thing. I think um, Leandria talked about this, like the. I guess it was imprecise, but in terms of opting out, what I really mean is what they have is a deep mistrust of the process. And that is because, you know, many of these kids were born in the 90s. I mean, some of them were born in the 2000s. I mean, this is unfathomable to me, but like these kids have virtually no memory of 9-11. They have, you know, the only president that they can remember is Barack Obama and Trump. And then you tell them there's COVID, they read all of these online stories about Russian influence. I mean, and then at Prairie View, you talk about voter suppression and there's a real sort of desire to be participatory, which is why I think these protests are so appealing, but then a deep mistrust of those 
systems that many of us have held sort of in great esteem, like the process of voting. Can I, can I just thank add, you, Grace? Yes. Just in the last in the last week, Melanie, we went mm -hmm. to uh, we had lead volunteers. You went to the post offices in Waller County, mm -hmm. and they were not allowed to leave voter registration cards. Right. And we were very upset about that. And, and there were several places in Harris County also, not in Fort Bend. So it was just varied as to which places were allowed to put out voter registration cards in a state that does not have online voter registration. This is the only access. There's no, no other places are opening. There are no gatherings. And the United States Postal Service has gone and done something, who knows what, to try to prevent this from happening. It is ridiculous. And I, and I just had to share that with you. Right. Because in the end, I think we would all agree that what we want is people to participate, right? Yeah. And we want, we want people to participate. And we also know the numbers of people who are actually indicted in terms of fraud and who are mm -hmm. actually brought to trial and actually convicted are, are, are minuscule, almost, you know, nothing. And so if that's the case, then we want as many people, when I teach intro to American government, when I teach my students about the constitution, I want to be able to say to them, maybe it didn't include you. And this is my white students too. It might not have included you, you know, when it was passed, it might not have included you when it was written, but look at all the things we've done, like the 19th amendment, like the 15th amendment, like the voting rights act. Look at all these things we've done to bring you into the process. And then I say, here's this archaic card you can have if you can find it, <laughs> fill it out and find a stamp, right? When they buy, all, they buy everything on Amazon, they read all their news on their telephone. They read their readings for class on their telephone. They get their information from Facebook and, and Twitter. And so the thing is, we have to be able to tell our students that we are moving with them, not sort of dragging them back into an America that existed before they were born. Yeah, and share the process. Share the right. process. And what we try to do, and I'd love to learn from you guys, is try to be and we, we try to be truthful and trusted and provide the accurate information. We, and when we're doing voter education, this is different, right? This is a, a panel on uh, uh, the 100th anniversary, but for voter education, we, just, we try to stay positive and let them know, let people know these, this, these are the steps. And we try to keep it simple because the law is not simple. It's a huge uh, election law that we have uh, that is very complicated. So what we try to do is keep everything as simple as possible so that they could know these are the three steps you need to take in order to join, uh, to be a voter and try and to I be think, welcoming as possible. I think when they get frustrated, here's the thing, I think Leandra would agree when you're teaching mm -hmm. people long swaths of history, the overwhelming part of it is all the detail. But the thing that is important to know is that all the victories that we celebrate, mm -hmm. all of the things that we celebrate, there was, it, it, it's all been, none of it happened overnight. Like we like to think, you know, um, that the woman, what's her name, rode that white horse down the, um, you know, <laughs> down the thoroughfare in Washington, D.C. And then all of a sudden, you know, women got the right to vote, but that was years later. And we like to think that Rosa Parks, you know, wouldn't give up her seat. And then the next thing you know, the civil, you know, the South was integrated, but it was years before that, right? And so the thing that we have to sort of prepare young people for is not that there is no victory, but sometimes it takes process. Sometimes you have to learn what the current system is, figure out what the solutions would be, Right, it's all of those kinds of things that help you understand the democratic process. And we have to get kids, you know, as early as possible. We have to get them involved in that. But at the same time, have to explain to them, I think, this is what I tell my students who are like, I'm not gonna vote because all the action is happening in the streets, that the protest, protest is where it's at. I tell them, you know, we have a toolbox as Americans of all the kinds of ways that we can participate we can write our congressman, we can run for office, we can
can protest, we can vote. We have lots of things we can do. And why would you limit yourself to just one part of that toolbox? I want to try to do, I don't want to run for office, but all of the other <laughs> ones. But I want to try to do all of the other things that I can do to sort of make my voice heard. So when I am angry about something that's happening in my neighborhood, I write my city council person or my state representative, but I also vote. And I also think, you know, it's fine to protest. And I also have participated in activist work. And so I think that what we want to do is sort of give people not, it's very important with young people that you don't act like voting is the only thing they can do. Uh -huh. Right, redistricting. Right, you and have to tell them that there's lots of things you can do to be a good citizen, and this is one of them, and it's one that's really important. Right. And it's one that I know the attendees on this call want to know. So open to all three of you, but how can attendees on this call do their part to honor the legacy of the 19th Amendment and also to break down these barriers that you've all talked about? Well, one thing that I was hoping to draw focus to um, at this moment is a, a fun way to participate, which is um, the Houston Public Library, UH Friends of Women's Studies, and the Houston League of Women Voters launched, um, as soon as 2020 hit, a Suffrage Centennial Book Club. And so we picked a film and a book for each month, and some of our um, authors are doing virtual um, you know, events like this moving forward. But it's a really good way to, especially since we're all at home too many hours, um, to dig in and reflect. And some of the um, titles go and focus on the suffrage movement moving up to 1920. And some think about, you know, how do we deal with um, voter uh, suppression today? Um, and so I really encourage you all to get your friends together to have some Zoom sessions um, about those because one of the things that's really important is to acknowledge, um, you know, women as thinkers and women's voices. And so I think that, um, you know, a lot of uh, what started in the suffrage movement were petitioning, um, you know, male legislators and writing those letters. And, and so we can learn some of these tactics that still work for us. Um, by going back in this particular kind of way. Um, I also wanted to plug that my students are going to be um, tweeting about uh, what's going on in um, Houston with the H-Town Vote Watch handle. Um, and so I think one way to really engage young people is to um, have them watch and you know provide oversight and um, be active not just as voters but thinking about how to vote and who has access and who doesn't and so uh, one great way to engage students definitely is through social media and to hear them is through social media i would say also it's really important to encourage young people uh, to talk to each other because it really shouldn't come from me or from your your mother or grandmother, it should come from your friends and you should tell all your friends and, and talk to them about voting and encourage them to vote. The one issue that I would like, and, and I would encourage them before COVID, what I would say is get together with all your friends, have a pizza party, look at vote411.org and uh, compare candidates and decide who you're gonna vote for, make right. a list, take it to the polling place. Now I would say, have a Zoom meeting, get your pizza out, have, have a Coke, and compare candidates and decide with vote411.org and decide who you're gonna vote for. This is the first election, I'm just gonna do a few little blurbs. This is the first election without uh, straight party voting. Everybody right. needs to take a list of their candidates that they're going to vote for to uh, the ballot place. And you could get- Y'all still put the list in the paper, the League of Women Voters, the list in the in the newspaper of all the people who are running. I remember it's those so little- It's so hard because there's so many precincts and there's little areas that have like constables and stuff. And so what you do is you go to your county election website uh -huh. and you print up your ballot. And you oh, okay. if you have a printer and you mark that ballot, if you don't have a printer, then you go to vote for one one, you just write down everybody's name that you're gonna vote mm -hmm. for. And you have that list because you cannot open your phone in the right. polling place. 
And so I just wanted to, to put that out there. That's what I would do, because it shouldn't be, it should be people, voters talking to each other and encouraging everybody uh, to vote. And if there's a problem, let us know, let election protection know, we will help you, we will walk you through that process. The so, thing I like about that, Grace, too, is it gives them the opportunity to talk about it beforehand. Mm -hmm. And it does, so also maybe think about not, by, not always just inviting people who you think might agree with you, right? You never know. People have different kinds of information. I think part of the problem in our society today is that we don't have a good a, example of how to engage in civil discourse around politics. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing we could do is start trying that for ourselves in smaller groups with people who we disagree with. And I like I tell my students, like in my class, there are rules about engagement, right? We engage on the substance. We don't make anything personal, right? So we don't say, you know, I'm voting for, you know, Grace. And then you say, I think you're dressed up. Like we don't, we have discussions about the substance. Because in a lot of ways, our, even our political models in the media is a lot of talking past each other. It's a lot of personal attacks rather than talking about why we believe things. And so if you can get together with people you know to have civil discussion, I mean, it's very difficult um, mm. in this moment. But if you can get together to do those kinds of things, I think it's particularly helpful. Were you finished, Grace? I, didn't, I just thought that was no, so great. I love that. I think that's great. I was trying to remember the name of an organization that focuses on that, but it just escapes me. I don't, I don't know. I think also a thing we can do, by the way, to honor the legacy of those women is, first of all, if you're a woman who has any interest in politics, consider running for office. The thing that women often say about why they run is because somebody asked them to. And oftentimes women don't get asked to run for office they don't necessarily come out of the same kinds of pipelines that you expect male um, candidates to come from. They're not lawyers in big accounting firms who then get recruited, you know, and they're not uh, heads of corporations, those kinds of people who get recruited. So consider running for office if you're a woman, but also consider giving money, especially early money, to women candidates, right? And so what I do is at the beginning of elections, if I see people who I'm like, oh, that lady, I don't know if she's going anywhere, but she said something interesting, I might give her $25 or I might give her $20, which seems like nothing in the big scheme of things, but also women have a hard time er earning money in the startup of campaigns. Mm -hmm. And so it's when it's most critical for them. And so if you can do things like that, then what we're doing is advancing the project of the 19th century. The 19th Amendment got us the ability to vote, but their thinking behind that is then we would also be in the in the halls of power and then we would be running those halls, right? And so that the way that that progress works is that we make sure, and if you're partisan, there are women's organizations. So Emily's list is the one on the Democratic side, but there are ones on the Republican side. If you're interested in just trying to help young women, there are voting organizations like She the People that uh, work, are higher heights that just work with women of color. I mean, there's all kinds of organizations around now that can help you train, if you, that help you do training if you're interested in running, and that can help you identify women candidates that might be good people to bet on earlier in the process. Thank you all so much. I just want to be cognizant that we are at time. We could all talk all day about this, and it's hard to fit 100 years and all of the issues at present time into one hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so while we're here today commemorating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, we also have to acknowledge all of the work that there is to do to achieve the 19th Amendment's promise to properly pay tribute to the suffrage suffragists, it's crucial to continue fighting for fair and equitable rights for all. And we hope that this conversation has not only evoked a deep respect for our mothers, grandmothers, sisters, aunts, great grandmothers, and all those who supported the cause and voted for the ratification of the 19th Amendment, but it has, that it has also served as a reminder that we all have that responsibility and power to help realize a more equitable future. 
On behalf of ADL Southwest Region and the Women's Initiative, I want to thank our three amazing panelists for sharing their wealth of knowledge with us today. And thank you all for taking the time to join us for this very timely and important conversation. Thank you. Thank you.